Last year, I trial ran two podcasts, one with Ronnie LeDrew and the other with Ian Luckland. And guess what, my friends, you kind of like them. So now, after a short break away, I am back, not with one or even two, but a full series of fantastic podcasts. So let the fun begin. It's the next podcast, and it's happening right now. Be my guest, be my guest, be my guest with Sean Boy Joe. I am the music man, and I can play the pots and pans. I am the music man. Hello, people, and welcome to another Be My Guest podcast with me, your boy, Sean Boy Joe. Oh, yes, I'm back with another fantastic podcast for you today. If you like what I do, then smash the subscribe button and give us a cheeky little like while you're there as well. Now, on to today's guest. And you could say I am wearing my best tartan in honour of my guest today, who has been entertaining children and families across Scotland and beyond for more than 30 years, with a BAFTA and an MBE to his name. Oh yes, it is my pleasure to welcome the Singing Kettle's very own music man, Gary Copland, be my guest. I'm Scott's music man, and I am talking to Sean's podcast. There you go, he can literally make up anything. How are you, Gary? I'm great. It's still sunny in Edinburgh. I stay in Edinburgh, so it's still sunny up here. Brilliant. My, grand, my grandkids have left the house. And I've got some peace and quiet, so it's great. Lovely. It's nice to be in tranquility with your piano and just peace and quiet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, let's uh, go back to the very beginning, because what an absolute wonderful career you've had. Um, you know, I'm sure you would agree that it's been a it's been a very fortunate career that you've had more than 30 years entertaining uh, children and families, as I've said. Um, so talk to me about a, a little wee Gary, um, if I can do my best Scottish accent, which I'm no good at. Uh, so talk to me about uh, Gary growing up as a, a little kid. Did you come from a musical background originally? My dad liked to sing, so basically um, I got a small accordion from a club book and I put the numbers down it, you know, so I taught myself by ear, so every right. number, Scotland the Brave, for example, is... One, one, three, one, three, five, eight, eight, seven, eight, five, three, five, four, six. So I taught myself by ear. Then I went to, I was born in Dumfries, and I was raised in Dumfries, which is a great place. And I went to Dumfries Town Band, played the trombone. I played at the saxophone in Dumfries Jazz Band. I played at the accordion club. And then I played the piano as well. So wow. that's where I was. So um, that's sort of how you started out. You had the musical background. That's right, yeah. I mean, the accordion was the best thing to learn because you can then figure out what places you've got to sing. And then I remember even having to go and play for singers in pubs, which was great. Right. When I was 14. 14. And basically wow. someone's singing, and you have to try and, and... You've never heard the song before, but you have to try and accompany them. And I seemed to just pick that up so great. So that was the best thing, was backing singers for a musical ability. Right. So you started out very young then at the age of 14. Yeah, I was starting when I was seven. Seven, wow, okay. Yeah, that's seven. Yeah, seven. I've played ever since. Okay. Um, so what was the uh, transition into sort of doing the clubs and the pubs? I guess they were sort of regional Scottish cities that you were playing. That's right. Well, I moved up to Edinburgh to study music. 
And when I moved into Edinburgh, because I was always playing in, in clubs and hotels, I put an advert in the Edinburgh evening paper, the evening news, saying accordion keyboard player available for some gigs. And I got a, a phone call from a guy from Run Rink, which is a band in Scotland, Run Rink, famous Scottish band. And also got one from um, some hotels, but I got one from a guy called Artie Rise. Right. Well, that's a, a funny second name. And he said he was interested in starting a kid's show. And so I went across to meet him in Fife. And then we had one rehearsal. Um, I mean, I, I didn't even know some of the songs that were singing, but because my ability to actually back singers just picked it up immediately. Right. And did the first singing kettle gig the next day in Dulkey. There we go. Wow. And what year was that? Good question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long time ago. I was, I was 19. You were 19 when you did your very yeah, first you kettle gig. Um, yeah. So that answers the question, really. That was the transition from going to the clubs and the pubs to the singing kettle, which I guess then for you was sort of your main venture out into sort of the public eye. Yeah, I always remember uh, an agent in Edinburgh who was getting about three gigs uh, Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Right. I said, well, I can't, I can't uh, do this Saturday because I'm going to I'm going to start a theatre company with the singing kettle. Right. And he said, well, that'll never take off. Just, just knock me into three gigs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, still laughs at that. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. Um, so, obviously, you mentioned uh, the singing kettle. So talk to us uh, a little bit about how that came about. What was the seed? Well, the seed was, Phil and Arty were folk musicians, well, not musicians, they were singers. Right. And they were needing a musician. Right. Um, that could uh, turn uh, basically Scottish songs into a theatre show. Right, OK. So I, think, I, I think I was the link that therefore turned it from being just like, singing with a guitar into a big show. Right. So, so that, that's my, that was my ability and help write songs with Silla. Right. That was it. Right. Amazingly, um, from when you started out in the singing kettle, um, you talked about that transition and how, how it grew, grew and grew. And then obviously, you know, later down the line, you, you know, you mentioned Silla and Artie, they were folk singers performing as Silla and Artie and then performing as the Singing Kettle. Where did the name come about? Because I know that, uh, um, I believe that Silla and Artie were from King's Kettle in Fife. Uh, so is that where they got the name from? Yeah, Silla and Artie stayed in a village called King's Kettle, which is lo known locally as Kettle. Right. It was, and it was, I mean, it's called Kettle Primary, right. Kettle Post Office. So Singing Kettle was the obvious one. And, I mean, basically then Scylla made up a rhyme, just like Spout, Handle, and up Metal, what's the sign of Singing Kettle. Right. And then I put the music to, which was Spout, Handle, Lit, Up Metal, What's Inside the Singing Kettle. Hurrah! What was the, I guess, the transition from the rhyme to actually having physical kettles? Well, we had small kettles. Right. Tiny ones, you know, that you'd, um, your granny or your mum would have in right. the old kitchen. But then, as we, someone said, well, you should maybe get yourself a set, we, we started to get bigger kettles. Right. And we, got, we actually got them, the big ones made in Wolves in Wolverhampton. Okay. Um, you know, fiberglass ones that cost right. a fortune. But yeah, made. yeah. We've got a picture here on the screen of uh, how the kettles used to be very different to how they turned out to be in the end. Um, as you can see here, uh, well, as our viewers can see, there's the original kettles, and there's the kettles that we know which have the beautiful smiling face on them, um, and different coloured kettles as well. Yeah. I mean, basically, the more people that started to hear about us, and it was part of the mouth that really spread throughout Scotland to come and see us. And, for example, we were doing um, a different show every week in Edinburgh at the Ross Bandstand, which is a big um, garden in Edinburgh, Princess Street Gardens. Right. And, I mean, I think we were playing to, like, maybe a hundred. The next week, we were playing to a thousand. Wow. And, and I remember doing one show called The Homemade Band, where we asked the kids to bring along their 
pots and pans. Yes. And and belt along, you know, with the the tune that we were playing. And the the council, Edinburgh Council, came down and said, could we ask them to stop doing that because we were actually making more noise than motor oh, really? in the playhouse the night before. Wow. <laughs> wow. That that that's that's quite extraordinary. Do you know I have an MBE and a BAFTA to my name? Um, so let's yeah, let's, yeah. Uh, let's talk about uh, just um, so we can mention for those that don't sort of know the one person who doesn't know the premise because we hadn't actually spoken about the premise. But um, you know, it's it's song based. You've got the rhyme there. You say the rhyme. You open the kettles, and inside is a is a little object that will give you a clue to the next song that you're about to sing. But there are always link. Exactly, so the ring you say is this thing. Handle, with dog metal, what's inside this thing? Right, like Sean, there's something in the kettle. Um, here's a clue. Okay. It's long. Right. You can eat it. Okay. It's got a bend in it. Any idea? Oh, I might say it's a banana. Well done, yay, and the internet goes poof. We've got an exclusive from Gary. He's given us a new song. There we go. Um, on his uh, upcoming greatest hits album from Gary MBE. There we go. Um, which you literally, yeah, literally could do that. Let's talk about going from doing the small little gigs with the kettles to being approached by uh, the BBC. Because you were approached by the BBC to do a, a, a very, what turned out to be a very successful BAFTA award winning series for the BBC. Um, you were, you started out, I believe it was in, you were filming in a school, was that correct? Yeah, um, we were filming in schools, but what had happened, Arte, I mean, to give Arte a lot of duty, he was right. a really good businessman. Right. And in those days, children's entertainers were just sort of looked upon as like, oh, there's a way to entertain the kids, we don't want anything to do with you. Right. Arty was of this caliber where he says, no, you're just as good as adults because we'd already played for adults and we knew what it was like, so we yeah. didn't get treated any differently yeah. being a children's entertainer. So we were doing a show in Glasgow and Arty had asked um, one of the BBC to come along to see the reaction of the kids. And from there, we just managed to get a BBC series and then another one was great. Well, there you go. I don't think there'd ever been anything quite like that in terms of uh, um, in terms of a musical group on children's television at that time. I mean, there have been lots since that I guess have you to thank for, not just in this country but all over the world. In terms of how the series was structured, um, uh, initially it was, I guess, just one live performance and then it was chopped into five, ten-minute segments and produced for the BBC that way and then released on videotape. Exactly, that's right. And I mean, it was really more song-orientated, which is still, I mean, a better way, but right. you know, having to have the rhyme in the, the middle, right. pick, out a, pick out a clue, sing another song, right. and then as we progressed, it then became more story-based. Yes. And also... Um, helped with our theatre shows, but our big live theatres. Right. Because we only we really only spent maybe like three weeks filming a series. Right. But we were on the road in Scotland filming every theatre every weekend. You know. Right. Okay, and then the obviously you've got the sales of the videotapes, which you relied on very much. So back then, I mean, lots of people did. Uh, and then after the uh, after the BBC series, you sort of went mainstream in terms of producing uh, arena and theatre shows. Well, that's right. And then, I mean, we were getting even companies up from Manchester to do the lights. Um, we were at the ACC. I think right. we had 40,000 people. Yeah. Um, the second year, we got more than that. We got an award saying we had more people than Dire Straits and Pavarotti. Yeah. So, Wow, that's saying something. Things. But I mean, at, at that point of view, I mean, therefore, 
we were eating up a lot of material and, and people were coming to see us right. more than once a year. Yeah. So that's when Phil and myself had to really come up with better musical ideas and like the fun one of the, the fun shows was Pirates that we did. Yeah. And that's when we really started on moving I mean, we kept the Scottish idiom, but we kept the, the songs like I'm a pirate, brave and bold, sailing the wide ocean, looking out for gold, with a yo-ho-ho, and a yo-ho-ho. Jolly Roger and the cannon gun, pirates for everyone. And I'm about to faint. There we go. I've just been transported back 25 years to the day you know you've gone from sort of uh, i guess a sort of niche market in terms of playing to a scottish audience and then you're out there in theaters you've got videos being produced that are not only being sold in 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 scotland but also internationally and people like myself londoners and all over the world people are getting to see the singing kettle and although it's you know very scottish with scottish flair it became a scottish show that was accessible to everybody, no matter where you were from? Well, that's right. I mean, we, we obviously played London, we did Belfast, right. Dublin, oh, every, everywhere as well as yeah. abroad. But right. um, if, if you take out a potato, which is Scotland, we call a tatty, right. everybody, uh, if you say to the kids, this is a tatty, they'll just say, it's a tatty. So maybe it was uh, only the older right. uh, people that thought, oh, we're not going to call that bit. I mean, it was fun. Yes. So therefore, I mean, we're just keeping that British difference, you know, it's just keeping it going, all the words, right. all the songs, all the scenes from all different regions going, so it's excellent. Right, yeah. Um, so you went into doing the theatre shows, you know, the World Tour was one of the first ones that you did. Uh, at its peak, at its height, uh, you performed the Christmas show in 1996, and that was released on video, and that's sort of when the spark happened. And he thought, this is actually, uh, you know, people are buying these videotapes. People who can't see us in Scotland are buying the videotapes and they're watching us in their homes. And then sort of after that show, and that was, I guess, when um, Cilla and Artie's daughter Jane was introduced uh, during the Christmas show. Yeah, that's right. I mean, Jane coming in was an ex excellent addition as right. well because she could sing harmonies with her mum. Yeah. Who when you just fight off each other as well, you know, and, and, and it really gave us a great spirit. Yes. Um, you were picked up by Scottish Television for ITV to do a, a very different series uh, to the one you did with the BBC, which had uh, more structure to it, which was uh, the Singing Kettle News. <laughs> right. So doing the singing kettle news was more acting as well as songs, and it was a great laugh. We enjoyed doing it, and it seemed to get a great response. Yeah. I mean, at one point, I remember looking at the video sales in one of the shops when they used to have a big poster of saying who's at the top. Yeah, yeah. And the singing kettle news was above Disney. Yeah. So. <laughs> yes. Absolutely, yes. It must be the thousands of videotapes that I just demanded every week. Um, absolutely. Uh, and of course you're on a mainstream channel like ITV, uh, Children's ITV, and you're broadcasting to, to millions. And you've got, a, you've got an audience of children in the studio uh, whilst the series is being filmed. Yeah, and, and the kids' faces for TV or even when we were on, we were on the stage, just right. actually... Yeah. Interacting, having a laugh, and it was that old thing where maybe in the nineteen sixties and seventies, where people would really have parties in right. tenement stairs, as we call them in Scotland. You know the flats, yeah, yeah, apartments, the properties, and they would have it with their families, and that was all going missing in the seventies and eighties. But right. in the nineties, it seemed like people wanted to go back to that, like having a great family show. Exactly. And that was what they're missing. So. Yeah. Exactly. And, and I guess as a performer, there's nothing like that in instant, spontaneous interaction that you get with an audience, you know, more so of children, because they can they can call out. And a lot of the the rhymes that you that you do are 
repetitive and as time goes on you can perform the same songs again and the children get to know those songs uh, more so than they did the first time round. That's right, yeah. And uh, there's so many, so many songs that uh, the singing kettle and yourself have performed over the years. Have you got a favourite? Um, I've got one. I like plenty of good songs. Uh, right. <laughs> there we go. Actually, I go to bed with no pajamas on, but there we go. <laughs> I have so no idea. Right? Yeah. What a what a fun little catchy song that was. You know, I remember vividly when uh, the cast would come out as these big characters in these amazing, brightly coloured costumes. Well, that's right. I mean, Silla was obviously a lovely singer. Right. I mean, obviously, being like a traditional Scottish Very singer sweet singer, best. yes. Yes. And covering all that aspect, just making sure that everything was moving along properly. The silent after, genius. But, exactly, but after he would be the guy, you know, the comedy that would come out where yeah. a nappy or something. Like right, that. yes. But, but I can't, he'd be the best up man, that's right. Right. And then when Jay came in, we had two people that could then get any costumes. It going. was the was perfect, perfect foil, wasn't it? Yeah. The song, that's right. Right. That's right. And then when Jay left um, to start our group um, for adults, right. another guy. Guy yes. He was our stage manager. Right. And um, I mean, when you're on tour with Kevin, it's just a laugh for me. Right. Laugh a minute. So he's just too funny. I mean, so he eventually <laughs> he became part of the show. Yeah. So Jane left, as you said, to, to be a part of a punk group, uh, Motormouth. Right. And uh, right. a brilliant uh, performer she was, uh, brought a very different aspect to it. Uh, I mean, she was involved in the Singing Kettle News and she did lots of uh, live performances as well. It was lovely to see the dynamic, as you said, between uh, mother and daughter and father and daughter. That was lovely to see the family there. Uh, and then, obviously, you mentioned uh, Kevin. Kevin had worked on the show behind the scenes. He'd also performed in a few of the uh, shows, dressed up as some of the characters. Uh, you know, of course, later we saw Bonzo. Well, that's right, dressed as Bonzo, the sort of old-time sort of big dog. Yes. Right. The audience comes down from maybe the age of 11 down to like 8. Right. And Bonzo in the show, that kept the audience up, you know, Absolutely. Like, you know, because there was jokes and laughs from that age as well. As Absolutely. The parents. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so he's gone from sort of being on stage, performing as uh, other characters well, to actually... Louis the Lion, that's right. That's right. And then sort of coming centre... Uh, yeah. in the forefront and he was just the the big silly clown to sort of as we as I said before the perfect foil for Artie to sort of be the yin and yang they could sort of have fun together and bounce off each other which was great to see and gave a different dynamic to the show and also a, a very larger than life character that children just fell in love with as if he'd been there from the very start. Well that's right I mean we only really had um, the business side Right. And he loved the performer as well. No wonder I could do the business all day. The lovely singing of Silla and the songwriting and then myself and then Kevin came along and he brought comedy, much more comedy right. to the show and he could play off it of Arte or Silla and Risby. Absolutely. Bonzo and Kevin gave that smuttiness that the adults could sit there and think actually yes that's that's quite funny even if sometimes it does go over heads of children but and bonzo was able to do the sort of p 
pee jokes as a as a dog would do, and, and yeah, it was it was it was brilliant to watch a little uh, after my time. But um, so yeah, so the so you've got the live shows and everything's going swimmingly. You know, you'll go from strength to strength. Um, you've got so many performances done. I mean, you've been doing it for. 30 odd years with the singing kettle, a, a real institution that generations, as you've said, have grown up watching, you know, whether it's on the TV or in the theatres and, and you're performing these amazing arena shows. What was your, I know it's like saying, what was your, what was your baby, but what was your favourite? Do you have a standout favourite moment or a standout show that you really enjoyed doing? A very broad thing. In a place called Cumbernauld, right. where I was set up, and kids, it was like a, a round, and the kids could actually touch my keyboard and my drum machine. Wow. <laughs> and while I'm playing, it's like, oh, you're playing away, and then you guys. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, oh, but I always loved the interaction. Yeah, oh, yeah. That's right. And you're right beside them. Well, another thing that we did was we got asked to play for. Princess of Jordan's birthday in Jordan. Right. We were sound. I mean, I've never realised that what it's like when you get to Heathrow and there's all all these sort of gangways just open up. And you yeah. Have a private car. It was like being the Beckhams for a week. Right. You know, and everybody's at the house. Right. Yeah. So it's like, I mean, I'm just a wee boy from the ski. You know? mm-hmm. um, and then I think maybe doing so many shows, you actually just become used to it. Yeah, it's, right. It's, 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 you, you know, find yourself, Sean, you open the French door and you have a laugh. Yes. The light comes on and you have a laugh. Exactly. That's and that and that's all you've been doing. And, it, you know, enjoying it and, you know, getting away with doing it, you know, for a long time, uh, brilliantly. Um, talk to us uh, about that moment that collectively, um, as the singing kettle, but rightly so yourself, uh, was awarded an MBE. Oh, yeah, that, we didn't expect that either. Um, just came through the post. Right. Very unexpectedly. Um, but it was a great day out in London. I mean, obviously, uh, my parents from their preschool yeah. came down. Artie's mum came down. Right. And all the family came down. And we had a great party the night before. Right. Because, like, Scottish people, sometimes we think it's not going to happen, so let's celebrate, celebrate before it. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> so I remember, I remember playing the piano in a pub in Knightsbridge. Right. And my father father was wanting to buy everybody in the hotel pub a drink, you know, that's it. Um, it was a great dad. My, my dad was singing away, Artie was singing away, right. singing Scottish folk songs and just yeah. sort of pop songs. It was a great time then. It was just great that the Queen, is for royalists, and it was great to hear the Queen it was actually going to present us with it, so it was lovely. There you go, so you were actually presented it by the Queen. Yeah. There we go, and it must have been a, well, I can imagine it would have been a real honour for you actually being presented by the Queen. It really was, I mean, exactly the Queen. The yeah, there you go. Um, I can imagine, did she say, oh, I I, I know your, your singing kettle songs? That's <laughs> she's exactly. I think we were very humble. Right. But, uh, by that time, I think uh, they were just, the kids were just too old, they were, they were the, the, the royal team. So we gave them some DVDs, but the, everybody that we met going in had said, oh, we're sick of you. We have me here, you have <laughs> <laughs> Yes. What was that? Um, talk to me then about that. Everybody has a moment where where they go, oh, actually, yes, people have recognised me now. I mean, you know, um, I've had guests say to me that there's a particular uh, point in my career where I was offered drinks after drinks to say thank you for looking after my kids um you know so what was the moment where you had the parents or the grown-ups sort of recognize you well being a children's entertainer is great because um, they realize that you're keeping the kids and giving them a great enjoyment right and they're peace yourself yes when they, you, when they meet you in the streets or in the supermarket or whatever it is they just say oh that's great great and it, i mean it was before all of the selfies and stuff like that. Yeah, but right. We get, we, get, we get that with fun box. But with um, the, the singing kettle, it's really, really funny. I mean, everybody in Scotland and through uh, most parts like, like, like Newcastle, yeah. London and that, we would recognise us. And it just, you just get used to it. It's, it's a great laugh. But nobody 
would uh, be offensive to you. No. Because you were doing a good job and you weren't a nasty character. Right. So you'd have nobody say, oh, all those singing kettle songs, I've heard them a hundred times over now, and you're going to sing them oh. again to my face. Oh, only when, only when I'm playing at weddings. And <laughs> right. Uh, it's great. But they, they, it's very funny. I mean, they'll just say, oh, Gary, can you do a, a, a mix of the, the singing kettle? <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you go, okay. Yeah, suddenly you're you're doing a sentimental ballad for a wedding, and then all of a sudden you break into you know the homemade band. Actually, yeah, that's right. exactly. That's it. Exactly. Yeah, quite a quite a, a funny you know transition. But um, lots of uh, talking about the songs, lots of sales from the CDs and greatest hits CDs, and also you know you're becoming you know not just stage artists but musical artists. You're selling CDs. You're recording artists. You know you're recording songs that are that are selling fast on CD. You're selling videos, you're selling caps, you're selling t-shirts, backpacks. Um, you know, it's it's sort of, yeah. it's taken off for you in, in the world of, you know, entertainment and all this merchandise, you know, that came from not just the website, but from your shop, because the Singing Kettle actually had a shop, didn't they? That's, that's right, Sean. Um, it's still enough to, and myself would all agree that people think that you're, you're so loaded with all the sales of this, but we never ever got a grant right. on these shows, and because of children's tickets, I mean, you can't say, um, in these days when we were performing with the singing kettle, I think our limit for a child's ticket was five pound. Right, okay. And, you know, because you can't charge more than that. For, so a family would come for 20 pounds or something like that, Right. Like a hundred pounds as it is. A no, pound. right, yeah, exactly. So, so you had to limit the, the. So, therefore, all our great sales of merchandise went towards putting on these great shows. Right. And paying, paying the staff, paying for the big sets, the lavish props, and stuff like that. But, I mean, we, we, we definitely we, we made money by all these sales. But again, that went into spending money on a £25,000 set. Wow. For the next show. And we used to do three shows, different um, shows a year. Yeah. You know, a Christmas show, maybe a farm show, a pirate show, a wild west show. Or yeah. Like but three different shows a year. Right. So you would, in a way, recycle um, some of the shows that you've done for a new audience. That's exactly it. And unfortunately, we weren't, we weren't able to give our sets away, although we did a, a, a sort of recycling show. Yeah. Um, because of insurance, if we, for example, if we gave our set away um, to a fun park or something like that, if anybody got injured, well, it's a single kettle set, so therefore, we just had to try and recycle the backs of the set, right. but a brand new show was made because we couldn't afford to store all these sets everywhere, you know? Yeah, you've done thousands of performances and thousands of different shows. It was lovely that you had that shop there. Uh, selling the products, you know, for people who maybe weren't Scottish-based and it gave them a chance to be able to see what you do as well. Exactly, because that was all pre-internet. Right. So therefore, people yeah. would visit, visit the shop, yeah. come in, and then that was it, they'd, they'd take the city. Did you ever visit the shop yourself? Did you ever make appearances at well, the shop? Yes, we did. We used to go in and if we were uh, exactly... You'd have the kids there, it's not a waxwork, it's the real people. That's right. Yeah. I mean, we did so many other things, for example, Children in Need would be at Edinburgh Waverley Station. Oh, at right. Five o'clock in the morning, yeah. setting off a, a train of kids going to London and stuff like that. So we were always doing um, appearances in shops and right. for charity as well. So that's right. The demographic that I get on this podcast, you'd be very surprised that people in their, in their 30s and their 40s who... Remember the singing kettle, or or anything that you know, any guest that I've been uh, interviewing. And I guess more so with the singing kettle, it resonated with children of all abilities. Um, and you work very, very closely uh, with your odd socks, uh, working with uh, a charity very close to your heart, which is the Down Syndrome Charity. Talk to us about that. That's right. Um, when my kids were at school, they were like. When right. we were like four and five, um, we, were, we had a guy called Ben, a lovely guy, um, and I don't say he's Down syndrome, he's just a great character, mm -hmm. um, and he wanted to play the accordion along with me, so I would just take him to Kayleigh's, and he'd play the accordion along, just sit there, and it was a great laugh, um, and he actually just got married, um, oh, he's a great, 
And so um, at that point, I mean, 20 years ago, I decided I'd become um, the first patron of Down syndrome. Right. There's about five of us, it's great. So and when we're picking kids for the stage, always made sure that always if there was a Down syndrome person or anybody with any disability or ability, I would just grab them and make sure they'd come on the stage. Yes, <laughs> it's, it's, it's that, that's the magic of, of that type of platform. Five minutes of your time is nothing to what these people deserve. Exactly, and uh, you know, and I know that you've been very good with that, as has RT. He's been very good with that during the lockdowns, doing his little Zoom shows, keeping the kettles alive, which is great. Um, so yeah, talk to us a, a, a little bit about the present day, or, or more so. Um, you've parked the the kettles aside, you know, which is yeah, a little bittersweet, as everybody loved the kettles and still do, and it was just, I mean, there was something magic about such a simple concept there. But you went from kettles um, to boxes, um, and it's now time for us to open the fun box. Yes, exactly. Uh, myself and Kevin, you were in the same kettle. Right. Well, unfortunately, when Silla and Arty decided to retire, they just stopped the company. Right. So, so that was, and we tried to buy the singing kettle, but Arty, quite rightly, he, he didn't want to sell it. So okay. Um, he didn't want to diminish what I previously went before. So right. Kevin and Anya, who was in the singing kettle for two years, right. started their own company. Right. And again, we had the same thing because we could still use songs. We still had all our contacts, people who made sets, props. I had all the contacts in the theatres. Right. And as soon as I realised that was the case, I took over the sort of management of getting the contracts. Right. Kevin and Anya did the Facebook, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, Kevin wrote the scripts along with Anya. The music Brilliant. The music was still all there. And... We, we jumped on like a, a train and we kept the train going. <laughs> yeah. And surprisingly, it sort of took off like a like a like a hand in a glove because people just fell in love with it just like they did with the singing kettle. That's right. I mean, our first show at the SEC, which is the big um, exhibition centre in right. Glasgow, was sold out. Wow. So that was it. And but the, the other nice thing was that. We needed some money to get us started, but because as I say, sets cost between thirty thousand. Yeah. You know, so. And um, you had some amazing sets. We did, yeah, we did a, a crowdfunder, and we were just hoping to raise um, a wee drop of money. Right. And within three days, I think we were up to twenty thousand. Wow. Well, so that's, that's testimony. The, the people of Scotland and England as well. Yeah. Who yeah. Realized that these songs are worth keeping and singing. Yeah. And, that was lovely. and I guess it helps knowing the people that are involved with it as well. I mean, people have grown up with you and 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 Kevin and um, you know, and and of course Anya more recently. So they sort of knew who they were investing in. They trusted in that. That's exactly. They, they, they bought the tickets, realised that they come along and see the same quality. Yeah. But it was just a, a new branch, and then after about two years, right. people had forgot about the singing kettle, right? Right. It was crazy. Yeah. Because you know, obviously with the same structures, that stuck. Yeah. And we recorded it. Yeah. <laughs> I remember, I, I went away to Tenerife after doing Christmas shows, and I remember right. me, 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 Kevin, and Anya writing the rhyme, and we did the music. So we did that. You, you and me, turn the key, open the locks of the fun box, and the music goes on a bit. Kevin went cha cha cha. And yeah. He came back and he says, Gary, the cha 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 has been kept. And I says, What? He says, ah, Yeah, it was popularity vote. Yeah. True enough. There we go. Yeah. So um, the the music lives on, and that's the the most important thing. But uh, as as you said, I suppose people, you know, as time goes on, people adapt and they learn to, uh, you know, adapt to to new things. And I guess you've got a, you know, an ever evolving, you know, generational audience of children, um, you know, that just want to hear those songs. And and you've got the adults that can fondly remember. You know, the kettles, I'm sure if I was sitting watching Fun Box, I would be thinking, mm, I'm old enough to remember when those boxes were kettles. Um, exactly. Yeah, so, as I said before, it's uh, it. you know you've got something right when 
you know, somebody like my cousin who's 11 years of age now, you know, I, I was able to sit with him, you know, five, six years ago and look at him watching the singing kettle, getting just as much enjoyment as I did 20, 25 years ago, which you just don't get now. It's quite a magical thing to see. No, it, it is. You just don't get that type of, you know, you, you just that longevity. That's a problem. And even TV producers will say that. Right. That's the case. You know, they'll just say, oh, kids are wanting something else. Right. But have kids, kids, kids haven't changed. No. You know? No. But I think TV has changed. The market has changed. Yes, you're exactly right. right. I'm going to ask the question, uh, two questions uh, before the podcast ends. The first one is, Talk to me about what a, a young Gary, you know, a little five, six-year-old Gary was watching on the old telly box when he was younger. Oh, look at that. You're not going to tell me you were involved in that either, are you? No, I'm not. Oh, thank goodness. I'm just relieved that you, you, you said, no, I haven't been involved in that. We finally found a guest that was not involved in play school. Now, you've actually got a story, haven't you, that you want to share with us about an experience that happened to you uh, related to uh, watching uh, television growing up. Talk to us about that. And my personal story is that um, when I was seven years old, I went to get the jag for the mumps. Right. And two weeks later, I took, I took an epileptic fit. Oh, wow. And um, I, I was epileptic until I was 20. Right. So it was amazing. But I remember, for example, um, this, is, this is quite funny, but it's somber as well, because I remember watching, like... The Magic Roundabout. Brilliant. You know, but also, it's somber because I remember taking a fit when that program was on. Right. Um, so, so I've got so many memories, happy memories of yeah. this as well. But that's it, no. Um, so I'm also making sure that people with any things like epilepsy and that, right. I, I understand it totally. When I'm out and about, I say to them, look, this is what happened to me. Because I remember going to school and um, the teachers at high school were just saying, well, as long as Gary doesn't get a job that heals driving, and I think um, because right. being a children's entertainer, I do over 30,000 miles a year. So, I, could, right. I mean, look, look, I was luckily where I, I never ever took a fit after the age of 19, 20. Right, I see. That was fine, you know, but there you go. But no, so it was up. But I mean, most, most kids were always watching. Oh, yes, Thomas. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, great, brilliant. Great theme tune. Yeah, when the theme tune was brilliant. The original Grange Hill, yeah. Yeah, you can't beat the original Grange Hill. Very different to the to the nineties yeah. theme Grange Hill. Um, so yeah, brilliant. So you've, uh, of course, you know, we got insight into what you watched and what your kids watched as well, which is brilliant. Were they ever? Did you ever show your kids, um, you know, the things that you did as the singing kettle? Were they just well, mesmerised on stage? Wow. And, and I would say, can you please get that stuff? <laughs> yeah. I've just done that. I don't want to see it again. Exactly. Yeah. And I go, oh, I can't remember that. Right, it's yeah. So it's brilliant. So they must, so they knew, they knew that you were, you were, you know, daddy, but Gary who performed in the singing kettle. That's right. But they didn't like me picking them up from school because they thought we were, oh, who's Gary? But anyway. <laughs> yeah. Well, right. Stuff like that. Brilliant. How how lovely it must be to just have your kids watch you while you're doing the magic. I mean, I guess if you come home and I guess it's reassuring. You've come home. Oh well, she my daughter's watching me, so that's reassuring. Everybody else must be. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. So there you go. Um, there you go. Brilliant. Um, so the last question I have, from, I'm going to ask you the question. Um, you know, if I, I'm going to ask you this question, actually, a little different to what I ask guests. Um, 
Artie is still keeping the kettles going, of course, now. You know, he's he's back yeah, doing I'm the kettles. For Artie, Sean, because, I mean, um, Artie loves performing. And yeah. And he's like, he and really wants to do it forever. Right. It's so good for him. Exactly. Would you ever sort of go back with Artie and, you know, bring out the kettles again and do something with him? Maybe if we come to, like, a milestone kettle, like 50 years of the kettle, would you ever go back with him? Yeah, if there, if, if there was a, a place in Scotland where we had to raise money or something. Right. Like, oh, no problem. Yeah. I, mean, I do speak to Artie and there's no problem. Right. We got fight. Oh, there you go. So, never say never, we could have a kettle reunion once again. Um... Uh, you know, having said that, um, you know, they had a massive exhibition for the Singing Kettle, didn't they? Where they, where all the costumes, all of the set designs, you know, you got to meet Artie and Scylla and all the cast. They had a, a really big exhibition a few years back, didn't they, to celebrate? That's right. It, it, it emptied half of my attic of wow. costumes. Wow. So that was great. There we yeah, go. No, that, that was really, I mean, I think you're right, Sean, where people and ourselves realised yeah. wow this, this did make a, a big difference in Scottish yeah. society at the time that's it yeah in history really but you say you've got an attic full of stuff I know a lot of guests say to me I'm looking for somebody to take some things off me so if you want to send anything to London they'll go to a very good home um, but there we have it um, it's been it's been amazing to talk to you. You're still doing uh, festivals and, and shows, you know, to, to this present day. Um, so you're still entertaining, you know, families and, and, you know, older people now as well with your traditional songs. That's right. I mean, I, I play all the time. Yeah. Remember, I'm, I'm, I play 30 miles. That's my limit. Wow. My house. Yeah. So if anybody wants to book me, I don't actually come and play. It's quite funny. Right. Uh, so, so there's no chance of you coming to London any time soon then. <laughs> oh, sorry, man. <laughs> ah, there we go. We just have to... We've got a private concert right here for us right now. It's brilliant. Um, you've been playing all the way throughout, giving us a little nod to some of the some of the Kettle classics. So it's lovely to have been able to talk to you. It's lovely that you're, that you're still keeping the songs alive and also producing new songs. Um, that's brilliant. And uh, yeah, long... Last week, the, the, the internet's great. Uh, right. Songs for a pantomime. Oh, right. For Puss and Boots, I said, okay, so I wrote a couple of songs and I sent them back. Right. And then they said, Gary, they're brilliant. Yeah. Um, can you do me a favour? Would you be interested in writing a whole lot? So that's oh, wow. Last week, so. so there you go. So you're producing music for good old pantomimes now. Brilliant. Absolutely, absolutely brilliant. Um, so thank you so much, Gary. It's been a, It's been a very happy podcast. So from all of us to all of you, as the kettle once said, it is time for us to bid you farewell. Uh, thanks to, to my guest, Gary. Uh, this is quite possibly, uh, out of all the podcasts I've done, the most fun. Uh, I've loved every second of it. And if you want to find out a little bit uh, about what Gary does, I've also got a link down below to the charity that he is a patron of as well. So you can support them or just find out a little bit more about what they do and spread the word. All the best, Sean, and thanks for having me on. You're very welcome. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Do me the honours, Gary, and sign us out.